So San Francis, um, what should we call it? Is it a, is it a drama with a bit of comedy? Yeah, I mean, I hate this word, but I think it is a dramedy yeah. because it, it does have hopefully equal parts comedy and drama. So. But if blockbusters still existed, it would probably be in the comedy section. I think that's true. Yeah, a lot of people have yeah. said it's a comedy, which I'm happy for. I'm glad that people think that it's actually funny since it deals with a lot of serious issues. Yeah, you're the writer. Mm -hmm. So the project originates with you, mm -hmm. but then you came in and, and took over directing duties. Um, so I wanted to ask how, like, was this uh, a cooperation, a collaboration since the beginning in some shape or did it come after? Yeah, so yeah. did you want to take it? No, no, you can take it. We're a couple. Yeah. And so, and so um, we've been together for much longer than this script was even um, an idea. Good. Um, so I wouldn't we, want to be in a new relationship. Right. Like I know. So. <laughs> right. I know. Um, so we were already living together. Okay. And I started writing the script and I think I had like the first 10 pages and then mm -hmm. I had you read it. Yeah. And then, and it was, you know, I think there's like a common understanding that a director is this sort of demagogue. But I've always seen the role as more well, I've always seen films like very collaborative. Whether you're collaborating with the cinematographer, or the production designer, the actors, you know, what's the point of having all these people working with you if you don't trust them? So it wasn't a big jump to say, you know, this is a to have the shared credit, you know, a film by Kill Yourself and Alex Thompson. That it's like it really was, I think, more collaborative than most mm -hmm. screenwriter director relationships. Mm -hmm. Also because I feel like being a man, I'm coming from, from a much, I have to come from a, from a much more curious place, mm -hmm. um, and a much more empathetic, questioning place. So, um, yeah, I think the process kind of necessitated that, mm -hmm. and the content too. Mm -hmm. It's funny because, uh, I don't know if it's a specific thing about the programming here at this festival, but I've been watching a lot of films directed by women. Mm -hmm. and. And this is actually the first, uh, I've done a few interviews and I've had a few more scheduled. Mm -hmm. This is the first one that I'm actually interviewing a man. Mm -hmm. But this is for the film that in many ways is probably the most um, woman-centric of them all. Mm -hmm. So uh, on paper, like this looks like an interesting combination of, of like, for example, you um, coming into this with this material and how to negotiate and how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it was. It's really. I think I've. I think I've said this in one way or another before, but it's actually part of the director's job to again to be curious, to be empathetic, to like try to find the truth and intention behind everything, and it's it's pretty easy to put yourself in other people's shoes when you're willing to ask questions, and it was just great I think for me to have Kelly on set a team of incredible actors who were all there to like bring specificity and intention to the roles. Um, so in some ways, it, I, I was very aware of that mm. dynamic that, that you mentioned, just being a male yeah. director coming into this project. Um, but I definitely felt like I had your trust, yeah, which yeah. was, which allowed me to like ask questions that may have been stupid questions or, um, and, and take chances that might I might otherwise have sort of tread too carefully mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. You did a good job. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> I mean it. Um, and it's interesting what you said because um, this is a film that is very disarming in a way, um, in the way that it puts you um, in the middle of all these perspectives mm -hmm. of, of these different individuals, uh, all women, but not only. Um, and you really, uh, there's a crossfire element to it um, because you're, you're really assaulted on all sides by this just great sense of empathy. That's how I felt. Um, so there's, a, there's an element of like being um, really um, uh, taken from everywhere, but with, with, a, with a feeling that is inherently just so positive. I'm so glad. But is that also 
I imagine that's not something that you, when you sit down and write, it's not something that you consciously want to do. It actually was intentional. Okay. Yeah, the way that we approached this story was, we call it mass empathy. Okay. That every character in the film, except for maybe two. Yeah, I feel like we maybe... We messed up a little on two. We messed up a little. Um, but every, almost every character in the film should have that you should empathize with them, that there shouldn't be any villains, there shouldn't be any bad guys, so that, you know, the boyfriend character, Jace, that you, like, care about him. And he's really nice, and, and he's not an evil, you know, he's not, like, the evil, terrible boyfriend who responds. He responds in the exact right yeah. way. And I think that's so much more um, true to life, that it's not it's not separated into the good people and the bad people, it's people going through things and, and not necessarily being on the same page all the time, and that's where the conflict comes from. But it was intentional that every character should deepen throughout the, the movie, that you start off maybe thinking the character is one way, and then by the end, you understand that they have full humanity. And, um, yeah. Of course, a big part of this is the experience of working with this incredible kid. Yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, the, the mythology of like um, children actors is, is so vast. Mm -hmm. But I felt that this one had, was way more of a character, like the, a real character with mm -hmm. their own traits than what you normally encounter. So tell me about everything from, the, from choosing the actor to writing the character. Yeah, well, so I was actually a nanny. And so I have a lot of experience being around young children and knowing that they have real personalities from really early on. They are, you know, individual, unique people. And I based that character on two little girls that I used to nanny. And so a lot of that specificity comes from the personalities of those two girls. And like girls who I, I still just like, I loved, I love them so much. And, and they were like Francis in that they sometimes had fun and sometimes didn't want to be around, you know, that they were also like flawed and also, um, you know, really complex as people. And so I think that's where it came from in the writing. Yeah. And then casting Ramona, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we saw maybe 30 kids around that age. She was the youngest person that we saw. She was five. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I like to recollect this, it was like the most irresponsible choice. Because we had investors, this is literally like almost a toddler. Like she came in, she was like this tall, you know, yeah. she's just tiny and so young. And she was six by the time we started shooting. Okay. But um, she was just, she hadn't lost that sense of herself mm. in the process of getting the sides and coming into the audition room and rehearsing with her mom. There was a bit of Ramona that was still there. Mm. And she was just, I, I don't know, I think what you said is really right, that like kids have personalities. A lot of times when they're being directed, all the director really wants, often of an actor in general, is just say the lines, represent a certain thing, like if it's a beautiful person, be beautiful, if it's a precocious person, be cute and witty. And we approached her with the exact same like ethos that we approached everyone else, which is if we can get these people to show up on set as themselves mm -hmm. and bring themselves to the role, this film will be so much richer. It'll be so much more dynamic. It'll be more real. It'll be more real. Yeah. So it's funny because the movie is sort of commercial in a way, and it is. It's got this pop sensibility. Yeah. There's a cute kid in it. <laughs> <laughs> but just that we're disarming, you know. But it's it's also very, yeah, I hope, grounded and like yeah. real. And she's totally set the bar for that. I mean, from day one with her, we were like, okay, okay, this is the movie we're making. Mm -hmm. Like, she told, she set the bar very high. Okay. And did you, did you look for the kid first? Or did you have, like, for example, the two moms uh, already? Like, how was the interaction there? Yeah, so I wrote um, those two parts of the two moms with those actors in mind. Okay. They're friends of mine. They're like yeah. other, you know, we've been in plays together. I've been watching them on stage for years. Yeah. And so when I started writing the script, I wrote it for them, hoping that they would say yes. <laughs> we didn't know. And we loved out and they liked the script and they agreed to do it. And so the part of Francis was one of the few roles that we auditioned. Yeah. Almost everybody else, we were just like, hey, 
we like you. <laughs> Will you come act in this movie? Yeah. Um, yeah. When we just like knew that it would be really irresponsible to spend people's money without the right Francis. Mm -hmm. So we kind of said, it, we were like, okay, so we, it, we'll have auditions, and if we don't find Francis by June, we won't start shooting in July. And so that was it. We were raising money, we were working on the script, we cast almost maybe over half the parts. We knew who we wanted to go out to. Um, Max, who plays Jace, wasn't attached yet at that point. Mm -hmm. But I knew I wanted him and his actual roommate to play those roles. Are they um, the buddies? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, and I think we just totally lucked out. I mean, like, serendipity was on our side because she was. We saw a lot of wonderful people, but she was just like the one for this okay. part. Mm -hmm. And so, and you shot it in Chicago, and you were also from the area. Oh yeah. 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 We, we lived in Chicago. Right yeah, now. and we shot it in our apartment. Like Bridget's apartment is our real apartment, oh, yeah. um, and Jace's apartment is was his. that actor's real apartment. Wow. And so, there's a lot of authenticity that comes just from. It looks real because it is real. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I, like I, I haven't. Uh, I haven't gotten to a place yet where I'm like, all right, blank canvas, tear down the room, we're gonna make this a pharmacy. Okay. I would much rather just like find a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Like that seven of that department store we shoot in is this place called JJ Pepper, which is like an American chain of like okay. sort of, you know, convenience store. I've shot like three movies in that JJ Pepper. <laughs> in Chicago. Because the it's owner lives, regular. yeah, the <laughs> owner lives abroad. And so every time they like call him long distance and they're like, yeah, can these guys shoot in here? Yeah, okay, you want to talk to him? Okay. And then and it's just, it's, it's easy and it also, like everywhere that we shot was just real. Mm -hmm. Except for the pond. It wasn't a real pond. The pond, oh yeah, but she didn't actually fall in that pond. She never got put <laughs> yeah. in that pond. Just me. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. got in that pond. Yeah, I noticed the, there's a cat and then the sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it was too movie gross. Magic. We were like, we can't dunk this six year old. <laughs> in well, this, we, like, and we had a whole day of shooting. You know, that was like the first thing we shot. And we were like, gosh, she gets in the water. Yeah. And she's going to want to stay in the water, maybe. Which is she totally can't swim. reasonable. She, she, could, swim. she can't swim. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot of safety concerns. Yeah. And so we put our camera and our DP and everybody but her in the water yeah. with, with no safety. <laughs> and um, as to what you were saying before about this um, unabashed uh, going for this pop element, mm -hmm. from the visual side, um, yeah. what was the idea for how this would look? Because the film mm -hmm. is, has a certain aesthetic, it's, it's got this bright sense mm -hmm. of like this summer. Yeah. Not necessarily, not that I'm an expert in the Chicago summers or, or the particular areas within Chicago, which it's also interesting as a, as a choice, mm -hmm. because the, this is a suburb, very wealthy, I would assume, yeah. Yeah. for the most part, we're there at the, at the family's mm -hmm. house. Yeah, yeah. But like, just in terms of like the cinematography, the kind of vibe that you were wanting to go for in terms of the visuals. Yeah, well, I mean, I think Nate Herzeller is, is, is like a co-director in some ways mm -hmm. for me. He really, his, he starts with the story always. And so initially we were drawing a lot of inspiration from um, like Westerns actually, because in our mind we thought, you know, this is new turf for Bridget. She's entering into this world that she's not familiar with. And then she's gonna kind of come out of it, passing the hat to like the younger generation in a way. But pretty quickly we realized with Ramona, the most important thing was to like be ready to move and like ready to adjust, and so pretty quickly we fell back on like handheld uh, on the forty millimeter, which is a very like it's like a very human lens. It, there's a lot of comedy, but then there's also a lot of pathos in the forty. Mm -hmm. It's not like a thirty-five or a twenty-four, which the Coen brothers kind of prefer the wider lenses, where you're getting a lot of humor that's like inherent in the character of the lens. And so we started out on the 40 and just kind of like, that was our baseline. And then we knew the points at which we were going to bring in this huge 27 pound zoom lens that kind of brought in these, I don't know, grounding like documentary elements. Um, and Nate, the, the funny thing about the brightness and the color is that Nate shoots dark. He really pushes the image and then it 
gives it this character and this quality that really unifies it. Okay. But on the monitor, it was like we could barely see people's faces. And then he knew we were going to bolster the image in the, uh, in the color grade and create a sort of natural grain mm -hmm. by like pumping up those blues and the greens and um, it, it's not a warm summer it's more of like a like a pastel yeah. like summer you know there's and Bridget's shirt uh, our wardrobe kind of determined that too mm -hmm. since she wears that blue shirt uh, so much so um, I think the world cinematographically we just wanted to like use the tools of the camera to ground it because we knew that the story needed to like sneak in into people. We didn't want them to watch it and think like, oh, I'm watching some comedy or somebody's knocking me over the head with the message. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we wanted the camera to kind of observe as much as possible. That was my next question because this could very easily be um, portrayed as a issue film or like you know you want to make your point but yeah. and it feels on, to, on, to some extent it feels like you're um, purposefully um, going for like characters reactions are exactly the, the opposite of what yeah. you would expect what's the conventional mm -hmm. so were you worried that this would um, potentially expose the film would expose itself to that sort of criticism. Oh yeah, that was a major concern and something we really fought against is like, I hate issue films. Okay. I think they're so boring and they're such a drag and it always feels like, oh yeah, I should go see that movie because I know it's really important and I know I'm going to learn a lesson. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but it's, it's not a fun experience to go see movies like that, at least for me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, something that we wanted was not, not an, an irreverence necessarily, but for people to still have a good time as mm -hmm. they're watching this. And that also the, the issues that have been made into hot topic like issues are real experiences that people go through. Yeah. And it's not always, like abortion isn't always traumatic. Yeah. And it's really misunderstood in that way that it doesn't have to be this like, you know, deeply scarring experience that sometimes it can just a big goal of the film was for it to feel real and light and then also have moments of drama but for the audience never to be like okay this is i feel like i'm being preached to yes. and thank you for making that the part about the abortion for making it like that with, yeah. with a certain clarity but also not not um denying the character's feelings that right. they slowly come out later but just to avoid the usual, the usual thing like going to the doctor, changing your mind. And yeah, the exactly. Yeah. That's one of my least favorite. Now, whenever I see it in movies, I'm like, we're done with that. Like we've seen it so many times, and I guarantee the majority of women who go to get an abortion do not change their mind yeah. in the lobby of the clinic or like as the, it do, I, it is totally overrepresented. And yeah, a big goal was to not further that narrative. Because it's harmful. Yeah. It's, it's teaching women that, like, to be a, a good protagonist, you should change your mind. Yeah. And that's the thing is it's not, uh, our film isn't doing anything, isn't portraying the world in a way that is new. This is actually how most people's lives are, where they, they, are, they are getting abortions, they are changing their tires, you know, they are, like, going to the dentist like yeah, yeah. these because life doesn't stop for you to have like a third act revelation yeah. right most people are like experiencing life this way i think that for some reason we just think we have to condescend to audiences yeah. we think we have to like make it melodrama make it dramatic make it yeah. dramatic when in reality like th there are point like these things happen and it should be what is it? Yeah. A, a, an issue, but not... Not the issue. Not yeah, the big goal issue. is to, to have the abortion be an event and not yeah. the event. Yeah. Yeah. The because, again, the film shifts. Like, you'd be forgiven for thinking at that point that that's going to be the film. Yeah. But then, actually, um, that's not even the main right. thing. Um, but also, as you were saying, I think the point is that it's true. Like, this, it's not like this is a, a, a revelation of, like, we're showing this is just going to reality but also I think if you do it this film does it a number of times 
on different things. Mm -hmm. But the dynamic you feel it coming, like, okay, this is how it would normally be, and this film. I think that when you do it so many times, the audience is in a way like a kid, like they need to, like if, if they see it once, it registers and okay, they see it too many times, it might think, okay, so that's, that's the issue itself. Right, like right. We, are, mm -hmm. we are going through each and every instance of that yeah. and showing it. So it Which is, it's great because really early on in the process, Kelly told me that like the script was about shame. And I remember just being like, hmm, okay, I, I guess I see that. You know, I, and then when we, as we made the film, it became, and then it, we made the film and we finished the film and we took the film to festivals and it became so clear to me as people would come up afterwards and be like, I feel so comfortable talking yeah. about this, you know, not, not just abortion. No, but postpartum. Postpartum. I mean, like, you know, my, both of my grandmothers like talked about similar issues mm -hmm. because after they saw the film, they said, well, I guess I feel comfortable, like, you know, kind of half joking, but like, well, so I, I guess I feel comfortable talking about this now. Yeah. And I just think that's a real testament to like the intention that started the process, that like shame is something that we all can relate to. Yeah. Men, men and yeah, women. Exactly. Like, yeah, the thing is that I was feeling um, like you're in the middle of this, like the, the three characters, especially your character and the two moms, mm -hmm. when, when everything breaks down and finally everything just comes out. Mm -hmm. um, you're like, I'm you're just fully invested in this moment of like, I want to also participate and yeah. share this empathy, mm -hmm. but then at the same time, it's like, you know, I'm, uh, as a man, it's just, you, you feel that you're there, but also that it's not really your place. Right, um, right. But that was, that was interesting. And also another thing that you sort of leave in the background is, the artistic ambitions yeah. of the protagonist, mm -hmm. which also never come back into play mm -hmm. in a way that it's just overt. Yeah. Yeah, and that was something that you were really great about. Is like at the end, I was like, should Bridget like find <laughs> her artistic, <laughs> high, like find her artistic talent? And you were like, no. I, well, it's just so tough. I don't yeah. know what the right answer is. I don't know how to fucking do it. I don't know how to make that movie. Like. Yeah. Like, if she's an artist, if she's a painter, she ends up painting a picture. Right, if right, she's right. a poet, she writes the first lines of this really awesome poem. Yeah, if yeah. she's an actor, she successfully performs this monologue that's been stumping her. Well, and also, like, that's very, as an artist, whenever I see a movie that a person is suddenly a successful artist after being frustrated for a while, I'm like, I don't relate to that. Because it, it again, it doesn't feel very re realistic. Whereas I know a lot of people who, and I would include myself, like haven't achieved what they want to achieve and are still wrestling with that. That you don't at the end of, at, at the end of movies, it's not like, and I am now a successful artist. It's like people are still wrestling with dreams that for whatever reason didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was a funny thing to like discuss that because in every movie, every indie movie especially, it's like. You know, Joe works at a gas station, but he really wants to be, uh, you know, a video game designer. And then all these things happen, and then by the end of the movie, the video game is a metaphor, and it's really hard to know, like, what does a character do? Yeah. And in this film, she, we wanted to challenge ourselves to, like, make her a person. I forget, somebody said something really smart about the film, and I can't, <laughs> I can't remember who said this, but they said that um, there aren't any big external changes. Yeah. for the character. Nothing really changes in her circumstances. It's just there's a small internal, a very small internal shift where Francis says like, you're good as you are. And like, all it takes to be a good person is like, are, are, you, are you brave? Are you nice? And that's the tiniest internal shift, but that's the only thing that changes really. Yeah. And I don't know that we need to know what she's gonna go do at the end of the film. But in some ways, I think by that point, we are identifying with her. And so now we get to go, you know, that, that invites us into conversation. Yeah. You know, she leaves the frame so we can, like, yeah. stand up after the movie and be like, oh, cool. You know, <laughs> wow, okay. okay. Uh, that if it ended on her face, we'd be like, what's she going to do? What's she going to, you know, what's next? And uh, I don't know. I, I appreciate you asking that because it, it, now I'm remembering that that was something that we talked about a lot. Mm 
I'm really glad we didn't make that, <laughs> yeah. that, work, that movie where she like writes a poem. Yeah, she's in her car and she like <laughs> takes out a pen and like flicks it yeah. and it's like, you know. <laughs> and also another thing that I think you guys went um, just above was this, you know, the issue of, for example, making the blood such a such a, a profound element of the film. Mm -hmm. But there's the, the debate right now, and one thing is to incorporate that into the images that we're used to see, mm. to seeing, and that's good. But like this is this goes well beyond that, in, mm. in that it makes the blood and the bleeding, uh, the repeated bleeding for the film, mm -hmm. a central visual thing, mm -hmm. which yeah. I think is uh, like it might be the most subversive uh, and, and powerful thing. Yeah. Just Regardless of all the the, the drama around it, right. it's, mm -hmm. it's because it's visual. It's symbol, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. It's visual. yeah, and it's something that a lot of people. The thing that I found really interesting is that a lot of women are like, "Yup," because yeah. we're used to we're used to dealing with it for a quarter of our adult lives. Like one week out of every month, I'm like, Jesus Christ, I'm dealing with this like actual like blood all the time, and um, and so it's been really fascinating to see women be like. Mm -hmm. And it's been really interesting to to see people who aren't necessarily exposed to it in the same way all the time be like, oh, wow. Yeah, like, again, there's nothing radical about menstruation. It's a very normal thing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's yeah, like, but as a, this is more than, like, for me, it was, I was thinking about it because right before watching the film, I was reading this article about, um, you know, that they, they hired uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge to write. Oh, oh, it's Patrick! It's our friend Patrick! <laughs> <laughs> He's a filmmaker in the you, festival. You gotta go see Bohoki, it's an incredible film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's um, an amazing filmmaker, that's amazing really filmmaker. funny. His film is playing right now. Okay. <laughs> and just like that, he's gone. And he's gone. He's okay. a ghost in the night. Wow, yeah. I hope um, on the bottom of the screen it'll be yeah, like, yeah. off-camera, Bohoki yeah, filmmaker, yeah, yeah. Patrick Bresnan. <laughs> yeah. No, but like, so they, they hired... Um, the fleet bag yeah. uh, creator to to do the bond to punch up the bond script, yeah. and one of the actresses was saying, you know, we discussed the idea of like this, like I, I guess this is another uh, secret service agent, and like she's maybe at the beginning of a scene, she's going to this big action scene, mm -hmm. and she's just tossing casually tossing a tampon in the trash. Yeah, yeah. And and okay, that's like obviously you see that in a bond film, it would be uh, yeah. mind blowing. Yeah, but like that's just the representation of the thing, as you right. said. Right. Like, there's a there's even a responsibility to, to putting that on film more. Mm -hmm. Right. But then I liked how this uh, took that and, and sort of ran with it by yeah. making it just more than that. And right. Yeah, and also like I mean, so I actually so I actually had an abortion and I actually had that experience where like I felt like I was just the the result I felt like I was never going to stop bleeding and it sounds ridiculous to say it in that like raw of terms but then I recently um I had a friend who had a miscarriage and she texted me I feel like I'm never going to stop bleeding and it was one of those things where I was like this is something that women are dealing with and it's incredibly <laughs> frustrating because it is like you're trying to go about your life and you're having to like you know, change, not only change tampons, but but it's something that women that is like a, a very common frustration that it, it feels like half of the world doesn't know the extent. Um, and so it, it felt like in order to depict it, we've been asked if it was supposed to be like provocative, and it really wasn't. It was no, just supposed to be realistic. That's, I mean, it feels like implicitly subversive, but yeah. not in a way that the film is. Just doing it to. Well, like, like I think Jace is actually kind of. We, we ask ourselves really similar questions in every element where it's like. I remember us having a conversation where you were like, Jace has to do something like wrong, you know, to mm -hmm. inspire her to like leave the next day. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, maybe Jace really is just meaning the best. Yeah. Maybe he doesn't do anything wrong. You know, it's it's. It's like what would actually happen, and what would actually happen is that you know he might actually be like earnestly writing down all his emotions, and as everybody does, think that what he does is best for all of us. 
And the same thing with, with the blood. It was like, well, is this, is this real? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, this is real. So like, this belongs in the film. We shouldn't try to like create a reason to hide it or like shoot around it. Um, I think we, I like everybody involved was really pushing for as much blood as possible because it felt like a currency of realism where it was like, well, if we shy away from this, then we're like not really worth our um, mm -hmm. our socks or whatever the phrase yeah, is. Yeah. <laughs> worth our socks. Worth our socks. We're not worth our salt. Salt. salt yes. We're not worth our salt if we shy away from this. <laughs> like if we do everything, but I admit it, if we, if we like do all the plot things and all the character things and if we like pursue representation in this way, but then we're like, well, let's kind of do this like, yes. let's go on a really long lens and like make it really shallow and yeah, not really yeah. show it. That's why I love that scene with Jace in the yeah. beginning with the pillows because it just like... Oh, and so many people have been through that. Yeah, we get to be Jace too. If we're squeamish, we get to be him where he's yeah, like... Yeah. But it's not really... Squeamish. No, no, but he like walks us through it, you know? Yeah. He's like, we're like, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do. Because every like asshole is like, well, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. And it's like, just be a nice person about and it. Also, like, and also there is a version, you know, the, t the bad version of this film would be every man being grossed out. Yeah. yeah. But that's not reality. There are a lot of men yeah. who are lovely. But then, for some reason, every man assumes that a woman is in birth control in this film. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, that's something that I've experienced in my life. Really? Is it, because well, I don't know. I've, I've, I think the assumption is that if you're a woman, you're on birth control. That, that, is, that is the woman's like job to figure this out. Yeah. yeah. That it's not a conversation. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That to me is the, the one thing that maybe is um, stretching. The, oh, really? The, the, but hey, maybe, it, maybe it's... I, yeah. I don't doubt that that's your experience. But <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting because it comes up once and then it comes up right. with the, the musician. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's a, he was great because Jim really like... Talk about like maximal empathy. Jim like poor is like the nicest human in the world. And he like found the humanity in this like horrible character. And then a South by Southwest, somebody was like, How does it feel to play the asshole? And he was like, I didn't know I was playing the <laughs> asshole until this moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And you're also leveraging all of the uh, crude empathy from his character in The Wire, I would assume. Oh yes. My God. Somehow. Yeah, yeah. 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 The one instance of like where like the baggage an actor brings is actually yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, a lot of our crude empathy from the wire. We were so excited when he said yes to doing the film. We cried. We, we cried. Was our, we that was our really like cried. cry casting where we. We were like, oh we my wept. god, he's gonna do it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank yeah, you thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you for this is great. The, the, yeah. where, where is he going? I, I have no idea. He's got, I love that in all this discussion about blood, we're on these like deep red shades. Yeah, it's yeah. like Stanley <laughs> Kubrick kind of yeah. like room. Hey, this is Eric from MyOwnCinema.com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side.